Hi, Angela. Hi, Taylor. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you. Uh, big thanks to Angela um, and your colleagues there at the Venture Cafe and the Science Center for arranging this and hosting this. Um, before we jump in, a um, couple save the dates. Right, this Thursday is virtual first Thursday with Venture Cafe. Um, Info is on their website. Um, there's SIVA and a bunch of other galleries will have um, representation there. Um, we will doing we'll be doing another Venture Cafe and SIVA um, studio tour on February 18th at 5:30 with the very talented documentary photographer Ada Trillo. Um, you know this will be the same format. I'll be moderating, um, and you know her her work is great. So please come back for that in a couple weeks. And then um, word I think is starting to trickle out, but um, sort of future save the date is for online posts. So Philadelphia Open Studio Tours was supposed to happen in October, it got postponed until April, and we're gonna move it online just for everyone's um, health and safety. But um, by moving online, um, we're hoping to really kind of grow the audience, but really kind of grow the accessibility. So no more worrying about parking and um, if there's an Eagles game or you know whatever's <laughs> going on, um, all the things that um, you know I heard about last post, but um, that will be for um, each Wednesday in April. So the April 7th, April 14th, April 21st, and April 28th. There is um, uh, those specific dates are on the the post website, and I'll put that in the chat towards the end. Um, and that'll also be where there'll be information how um, participants or visitors can register for free tickets. But uh, excited for for that again, another uh, great collaboration with the, the folks at um, Science Center. But tonight, I'm excited to join you all uh, visit with uh, Taylor Pallott, a longtime post artist uh, and sculptor based in Fishtown here in Philadelphia. Originally from Fort Erie, Ontario, Canada, Taylor holds a BFA in sculpture from the University of Windsor in Ontario, and an MFA in sculpture from the University of South Florida. Uh, he's exhibited his work widely, both here in the US and internationally. 2015, when he came to Philly, he renovated a former beer studio, which is a beer, uh, sort of a beer distributor warehouse, which is where he is tonight. Um, founding Palat Studios, an artist studio building, and project space in Fishtown, home to numerous and varied makers. Um, we will leave, as Angel said, we will leave lots of time at the end for hopefully a, a conversation, some back and forth. So, um, as you think of them, put your questions in the chat, and then I will go through and um, start to pull those out. Um, towards the end. So if Taylor says something in the first couple minutes, you're like, oh, I would ask him that, put it in the chat so we kind of have a, a running record of that. So, um, with that, I'll turn it over to Taylor. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, as Michael said, I'm Taylor Pilot. We are currently, my neighbors would have to tell me to say that this is Port Richmond. Uh, we're on the Port Richmond Fishtown border, but we're Port Richmond strong over here too. So uh, thanks, Mike, Angela, uh, Emily um venture cafe so um i guess today is a little different than a typical artist talk i'm you know in my studio and i'm showing you um you know what i do every day what's hanging on the wall right now what i'm working towards what i've just finished um and um uh, working with this new uh portal camera which should give you a good view of everything in the studio um let me, I'll just stand out of the way and it might zoom out so you can kind of see where we are. Um, Palat Studios, like I said, if you guys are familiar with uh, Philadelphia, we're like at Aramingo and Huntington on the border of Fishtown and Port Richmond. Um, it's an old beer distributor building um, that we've renovated. I have uh, 10 other artists that are part of um, our building that do different types of things. and. Um, my studio takes up uh, a good portion of it and um, you can kind of see I have a little bit of everything. Um, I grew up in my dad's uh, body shop pretty, let's see if I can get that to refocus down there. Anyways, um, in, my dad, in my dad's body shop. So you can see like in the background here, um, various different process tools. Um, I'm kind of a pack rat. I have a little bit of everything, but um, in general, what we're going to do here, I'll take you through physically of, of what the space is, how it how it's laid out, what's going on in here, um, and along the way, the camera will kind of follow me around. You'll see some things that I'll come back to and talk to after, um, and then we'll work our way back um, and take some questions at the end. Um, so, as you can see back here. Let me see if I, I'll go behind the camera here and you'll 
Oh man, zoom out. Um, so you are looking at uh, back in the corner is my kind of metal area. Everything's on wheels, so we can move around um, and do a little bit of you know what needs done per project. My material, I'm uh, project based completely. So some projects are um, aqua resin, uh, a, a type of um, water based fiberglass. Uh, anything from casting to welding metal uh, fabrication, um, a little bit of everything, literally. So um, on the walls over here, I'll get back to that. But there's a, you know, I have kind of layout walls that double as um, working walls, but also semi-finished walls to kind of stand back and see what um, work I'm working on at the time. Um, and then if we tuck around, uh, I do have an opening so I can load big things in and out of the, the shop. So that kind of becomes the loading dock of all extra things. Um, and then over here, I kind of have a movable wall, which I have some finished work on right now. Um, I just finished up a uh, photo shoot with a couple of pieces. So there's some things that aren't in crates and aren't away. So you can kind of see what I'm working with. Um, I think Michael had put in, uh, or Angela, in the chat box, my website and um, both my Instagram accounts. So you can kind of see what prior work was. And um, and then we can work from there. So I'm, I'm literally going to talk about things that I'm physically working on in my space, um, and uh, and then go from there. So these these two pieces are um, pretty pretty typical of, of the recent aqua resin pieces. Um, let me stand behind here. Um, on your left would be um, it's a piece called Nomad. Um, field fresh blue so it's like a the hood ornament from a 55 chevy um if you can imagine kind of ripping the skin off of a 55 chevy and hanging it on a hook uh, much like you would uh hang you know spare parts for a car in a garage for um to either wither away or, or kind of to become a marker of future maybe future possibility or things like that um and on your right uh tnt which is um like a 70s Can-Am motorcycle tank that kind of the same way hung up um, on the wall. And it, it kind of has a slow demise uh, coming down the, the wall. Um, the TNT specifically, I uh, was a track and trail uh, motorcycle that um, Can-Am was started by uh, a guy, uh, Daniel Bombardier, which is like, uh, you know him for skidoos uh, probably. Um, but he was a successful um, designer, engineer, and um, kind of bridged with uh, some designers in California to become Can-Am, Canadian American. And, um, uh, you know, it kind of symbolizes this, you know, jump to the U.S. and, and uh, he had great success. So there's like somewhat of a, um, like a superstitious token of, uh, you know, hope for, me as a Canadian stepping over uh, into the States and, and hopefully uh, having some sort of similar success. Um, so these are aqua resin, like I said, um, finished in uh, automotive paints. So they're kind of an additive process and um, get finished just like you would have a car finished. So um, lift this off and kind of give you some Closer. I know it's nice to see physical things on, um, and then they hang with a French cleat. Um, but it also kind of gives you, um, along with some of the things, and as I go back through and kind of uh, unpack how these things are made, I, there's always um, either historical ads or um, small historical. Uh, tidbits of information that I try and impose, um, you know, where there's decisions to be made, there's an opportunity for um, meaning to be injected. So um, you guys can probably see this is like kind of a very similar era. Um, 
motorcycle, just, just, like I said, just uh, vintage ads that inspire along the way. Um, and uh, not that I would necessarily hang this up near a finished piece, but like as we go through, um, you'll see inspiration on the wall um, and like uh, quotes and things that, that get us going. Um, so, sorry, back to um, Nomad, which is this, like I said, the 55 Chevy. Um, a lot of my other works, and I'll show you, I kind of work in two separate um, fashions and, and some of what I would consider for me smaller works um, end up working um, very well to make multiples of. Uh, something like this is, you know, sculpture is difficult to deal with, right? So it's that like thing that you back up into when you're like looking at a painting in a gallery. So um, these things are very much so that you can, you know, you a, a collector knows what to do with this, right? It hangs like a painting. So I end up making small runs of more manageable pieces like this. Um, so I guess <clears throat> I can show you. So this is like the negative rubber mold with a fiberglass mother mold that I would make a multiple of that. So I've sculpted the first one, finished it very closely, um, almost finished, and then um, uh, you know finished from there. So. Uh, you can see another piece hanging here. It's just uh, in-process stuff as we flip around. This is like a, my main working wall, which I'll have to go stand in front of so that it centers. But um, so projects, depending on what I'm working on, um, it's not going to want to look up here. But up here we have... Uh, a piece that's based in uh, a 54 uh, Corvette in the, in the first couple of years of the Corvette. Um, very iconic, very expensive, but um, thinking about it the same way in, in hanging up, um, you know, layers of uh, not only uh, American history past, but uh, dealing with ideas of uh, nostalgia and, um, you know, hearkening back to a time where you know, America was probably uh, looked up to at, at its highest, um, you know, post-World Wars, um, you know, craftsmanship and, and the handmade was, was, you know, probably paramount and, and uh, garnered probably the most, um, probably at that most time, the most envy from around the world. So um, as I was saying, I kind of have things stapled up um, alongside of those. So it would either be, um, like I said, historical views and, and, and different aspects of what the car would look like. So if I hold this here more, you can kind of see um, that those tail lamp pieces end up becoming, um, you know, I guess an, an inference of what the car was. Um, and then the, the final product ends up being a more fluid, um, abstract objects. But you can see that parts, parts of these things I use um, preformed or reproduction like taillight bezels. Some things just don't make any sense to not buy a reproduction rather than making molds. Now, other things like the Can-Am tank, uh, I couldn't, I got a, an original, but I couldn't come to actually cutting it up. So I made a mold of that and then, um, built it from there. So it's like, it depends on, you know, the piece, but in, in, in this specific instance, um, those are like old reproduction, uh, fiberglass fenders for an airplane. So if you can imagine the wheels, like it's the aerodynamic bubble that kind of go over the wheels. So I do repurpose things. Um, I'm kind of avid. I was an avid Craigslist user and now I'm an avid Facebook marketplace user to kind of gather, um, materials and pieces of, of um, future sculptures that will make um, the process easier or, or jump me ahead and make these things happen um, um, quicker. So I, I also, you know, I, I gather all these things and sometimes the, the projects, you know, they, they jump out at me, whether depending um, 
you know, if I have the correct materials to do the project or if, um, you know, a, a perfect spot to show it comes up, like these things kind of come back to me and jump out of my studio as which one is the next to be built. So um, a long, a while ago, this was a kind of a, a rough sketch of what this would look like hanging over an, a door opening. So um, you can kind of see where they go from like, they're very, very, uh, initial concept, which these have been hanging on my wall for a while, but it's like you kind of figure out how or why this one needs to be the next to be built. Um, similarly, underneath, uh, these are the fins of uh, a 59 Cadillac, so it's a, a, a chrome reverse smoothie rim, and these, these two fins of a very, very iconic car kind of draped over the top. Um, and like that, again, that's a, a very, very rudimentary layout of what this thing will become. Um, from there, I, I work um, with the Aqua Resin. It's very, very similar to, to uh, fiberglass. So um, I work with actual fleece, um, like the shirt material. Um, and I completely submerge that in the resin. Um, so you go from like a, a very fluid, um, tactile material and then in about 30 25 to 30 minutes it becomes this hard form that takes the shape of how it falls so i'm kind of battling between um these upper pieces that i kind of lay out uh the initial form for and then i'm kind of at the materials mercy and my mercy for how uh, the bottom drapery falls um, so it's a fight between you know something unbelievable um, and maybe more car cartoonish, and then um, some sort of reality with material. Um, that, that specifically is a 49 uh, DeSoto, which the emblem, which is pretty cool, I can bring this off, um, is like this kind of um, Spanish uh, conquistador. Um, which was, uh, yeah, DeSoto was a, a Spanish conquistador. So that it's like um, specifically a, um, this piece is kind of difficult. I have my, my father-in-law passed away this year. So this um, is kind of an homage to him. He was kind of a, a avid world traveler and um, he owned a DeSoto as well. So there's like these kind of crazy ties as to why I make pieces of work and what you know, what pieces I find and how these things come together to, to figure out why I actually make them. Um, so that's, I would say like 30% into the process. So you start seeing forms, you start seeing the undulation of the fabric, um, and then you work on, on filling it from there. Um, I'm going to stand behind here and let you see that a little bit more. Does anybody have any questions as we go? I don't mind if, I know as we, as we go through, there's a bunch of stuff in the background too, that if you have a question about, you can ask. Um, there was you know, one at... question. Okay. Is aqua resin a less toxic alternative? Oh yeah, absolutely. My wife's in public health and uh, I used to use uh, uh, fiberglass resin, uh, polyester resin, and it, it's you know really, really toxic. Uh, not to say that this isn't any different when you're sanding it because particulate is not good and you're using um, a very similar, um, mesh um within it so um sanding and grinding it is but mixing it it's uh yeah it's a water-based two-part liquid part powder part um much 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 less toxic yeah <clears throat> i can show you actually you can throw an ask about the uh the maytag machines but we will yeah yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we'll get to those uh they're coming yeah let's go i'll go <laughs> right over to you can see them there, but we'll go to this stuff. So this is um, directly working off what your the last question was as far as the aqua resin. Like this is a big roll of like fiberglass matting. So that's very typical. Let me grab a piece. Like very typical. It's like a cross hatched fiberglass um, meshing. Um, more so what I was talking about with the drapery, it's like typical. Um, like actual fleece material. So once you completely uh, saturate this, you have you know that short window I was speaking with to kind of make it fall the way you want it to fall. And then 
uh, the chemical reaction happens and you, you, you have a, a physical form. Um, but this is, uh, these are some projects that I'm working on actually. Um, I had, uh, I had this, I had this dream that I was going through, um, like a, a field of dis, disrepaired cars. So not, not necessarily a junkyard, but someone's collection of, of cars. And, um, you know, you, you kind of walk through and you're figuring out, um, like what I could use or what I could, uh, like the, um, kind of the possibility of sitting there rotting in a field. Right. And, uh, I thought amongst them, I, I saw like a, a, a pile of Saul LeWitt, um, un, uh, the incomplete cubes. I don't think, I don't know if I, here, I have a photo of this. So I don't know if everybody looking has, you should know what this is, but so like these kind of, uh, there's kind of a, a diagnosis of, whoops, every, every possible, uh, com combination of sides of a cube in, uh, having all of the sides or less of the sides. And so it's very, very popular, uh, 70s formalist, uh, experiment in sculpture. But I thought of these, you know, probably highly collectible, very expensive things, um, sitting away, sitting in a field, rotting with these other cars. And, um, so I imagined it as pulling those out, um, you know, whether it was like a post-apocalyptic situation where, um, you know, they, they kind of fit perfectly for, um, a used, like a roadside used car or a used tire and a flat fix, um, display. So like if you, uh, you know, have any history of, of, see, of driving down the road and seeing, uh, like what I'm talking about, like used tires painted up different ways, uh, with signage for, you know, drawing people in off the street to get their flat fixed or, or to buy a used car, uh, tire. So I'm making these molds of, of a few tires and, um, I'm going to reproduce, uh, these Lewitt uh, cubes and make these, this kind of sideshow, um, roadside, uh, used tire sign. Um, so getting back to the material, um, this is a rubber mold and I, I have it filled here. You can see, you can see I have a thin layer in there now. So this rubber mold pulls out of the, the, the mother mold and I end up with halves of the tire, which you can see here. I have pretty, pretty really, really good detail. You can see even like the, you know, side lettering and things. Um, so these become, uh, you know, like this is two halves here that fit together perfectly. So you can see those stacks. So if you can conceptually imagine it as, uh, somebody pulling this, you know, high art object out of the scrap heap because they saw a utilitarian function aside from knowing that it was a, a very famous artwork, but using it for a very, another very utilitarian way. Um, so I'll have a mix of, of actual tires that are painted that wouldn't be that different from an actual sign. Um, the repurposed or, or refabricated Lewitts and, and some fabricated tires of my own. So it also implicates me in some way with Lewitt as well. And, um, you know, harkens back to my history, um, working in a body shop with my dad. So, um, that's kind of, I'm, I'm this is a bigger project that I'm working on and you work on the pieces and then you build it so that you have, um, you know, a, a larger idea of what this can be. So it's a modular idea where, um, you know, maybe you start as a stack of three, but, um, in a bigger venue or with a bigger opportunity, these things can, um, end up becoming, um, more immersive site specific installation. Um, so getting back to, Everybody was asking about these, but I'm working on a project um, with a collective out of Tampa, Florida, uh, called Crab Devil. Um, I guess you can look up their information at crabdevil one word uh, dot com. And um, so, I guess the easiest way to describe it is um, if you've ever heard of Meow Wolf in Santa Fe, um, it's kind of this uh, very large immersive art installation, but I, I guess how, um, the project called Peninsularium in, uh, Tampa, Florida is going to be run is that it's, I think a much more, um, 
culturally in, involved um, and, and definitely immersed in Florida roadside culture, specifically um, uh, my, my, uh, my part of this is a roadside laundromat, um, but um, kind of like a, a yeah, roadside, um, roadside immersive art installation. So it's gonna be a, a based on um, shipping container. So the side of the shipping container um, will have uh, seven of these units. So 14 dryers wide. Um, so you'll walk out to um, a courtyard of, of type and, and it'll be cut out of the side of, um, of the shipping container. So I'm gonna take a minute, I'm gonna turn it on. It's a little loud. So you can see kind of what they look like running and then I'll let you kind of take that in and um, we can come back and I can talk about that a little bit more. Just a minute. Okay, so that's obviously just like a, this is my first working model of what these things are gonna actually um, look like and how they're gonna work. But um, like I said, it'll be a, uh, a full lineup kind of as they're set up here in a long line, just like as if you were, um, if you walked into a roadside laundromat um, and uh, you know, all, all lit up neon lights and things like that. So um, this other unit actually, I set it up to have um kind of another uh you know cultural culturally embedded possibility so this one has a little bit of a smaller rim in it but i have them set up so that um i could actually take them into a physical laundromat air them down put it in air them up and actually you know pay quarters to have these things spin so um the overall um, give and take with the goal would, would be to have you know, you know, a line of six of these in um, a gallery space, but um, at the same time having, you know, say an opening uh, at a physical laundromat where kind of I insert these into the actual um, laundromat to have to bring the gallery to the laundromat and the laundromat to the gallery um, at the same time and have that kind of interaction um, on a different level, right? On one and in the gallery, you'd be looking at these things kinds of uh, as a fetish object, but on the other end, um, kind of looking at them, you know, as this um, personally activated, socially engaged, socially embedded uh, project. So um, these are like longer term projects. This, this, and uh, and and the roadside tire uh, installation um, all. Me, like during the meanwhile, I work on all of these other wall pieces, um, which are somewhat more hand manageable. Um, but it's ideas like this that I think you can see on my website. In 2012, I made um, a residential style 30 inch uh, General Electric dryer that perpetually spins a 20 inch rim. Um, and that one's much more um, fetishized and, and way more over the top as far as custom paint and things like that. Um, but in some respect, that piece itself was, you know, a maquette for a bigger thing. So um, while I toil with these other wall pieces, there's bigger things that happen in the background like these that wait for either the money, the funding, the opportunity, um, or things like that. So I'm kind of split between um, kind of these two facets where I'm working with um, what I would consider like 
the skin pieces or like the layer pieces that are like these drapery um, pieces that are kind of um, what I feel like uh, maybe unpacking uh, some maybe masculine tropes that that at first I was lured into uh, um, being you know part of a, uh, the greater car culture and being um, not only immersed in that but very interested in it but then also kind of making pieces that um, spin out of uh, s other people's social um, aesthetic choices. So it's like, you know, putting $3,000 rims on a $1,000 car. Um, and like what, what kind of, uh, what kind of skin that, or, or what kind of, uh, idea that puts forward of, of who you are. I mean, I grew up in my dad's body shop and we were always, um, you know, buying the cheapest thing as far as our own car, making it as nice as possible, kind of like a keeping up with the Joneses situation where, um, you know, a little bit of elbow grease kind of, allowed you to kind of hit above your, uh, your average and, and, you know, um, where, where the guy that could pay for the Cadillac, um, was kind of mad that the people would come and look at your Chevy because of what kind of elbow grease and what, what your physical skill you put in to, to make. So, um, I think specifically with the dryer pieces, uh, and, and moving forward with that being kind of part of a bigger, congregation of artists and, and kind of a wider frame of, of a socially in, engaged project. Um, you know, um, I, I come from probably more of the side that would use the dryer um, and not have my own at home rather than the person who would be coming to see this, you know, at a gallery necessarily. But um, um, you toe the line, right? I, I grew up, I, I say I grew up, um, you know, not knowing art at all. My, both my parents were um, hardworking entrepreneurs, but, um, you know, I kind of had blue collar upbringing, but I had, you know, where I acquired um, high art interests. And so those things kind of definitely clash um, in good ways and bads in, in the studio. Um, and and they, they become outputs in many different ways, but um, depending on, like I said, the funding or, or the opportunity um, or, you know, what material I find, um, it kind of changes um, what the output of the studio actually becomes. So um, I guess at that, I don't know where are we at time-wise, Mike? I think we're good on time. Um, you know, the okay. couple questions came in that, you know, I think I think you answered, right? I mean, talk for the residents, someone asked, are those hubcap spinners in the drop? Those are- These? Yeah. So these are, they're actually physical um, rims. So the bigger, the bigger of the two oh, here are, is like a 20 inch rim. So that kind of fits specifically into the drum of the dryer. So these are uh, 30 pound um, commercial dryers, just like you would see in a laundromat. I can pan over here and you can see I have one kind of scavenged. So this, <laughs> you can't really see it all, but this is like, it all torn apart and then I have a crate and the, and the other mold sitting on the two drums there you can see here and here um, and like the door panels and things like that down here. So these get um, stripped all the way down and then pulled apart and the rim itself gets fabricated into the into the piece. So um, the rim itself is like under what the max uh, lawn like wet laundry could go in there. So it really runs exactly as it would um, if you were using it as its intended purpose. Um, I was going to ask, I mean, you talked about this a little bit at the end, like there, there's like, I feel like there's all these sort of dualities with both your work and your practice, right? This sort of, mm -hmm. your, as you said, you know, these kind of lowbrow um, kind of roots in these sort of high, you know, in this sort of highbrow art world, um, you know, even, you know, you sort of talk about, you know, this sort of American nostalgia for, mm -hmm. you know, the golden age of the, you know the the American automobile or the or the muscle car now you know another your work now like it starts to feel a little bit melancholy like it's sort of just kind of almost like resigned to the wall I mean they they, they have a they have such like a, a sad kind of thing to them not in a, yeah I mean, you know, I, I, mean I, I guess not necessarily like there's always been like a my intent was not necessarily for them all to be sad right but it's like you know pulling your favorite coat off and hanging it 
in the closet, it's not necessarily sad. It, maybe it's sad at the time, but like it's there for another opportunity. And I think, um, like I said, when, you know, growing up when I was very, very intrigued by a hot rod culture coming, you know, po post-World War, like um, post-World War II, like uh, things that we were making as American. And, and this sounds funny because I'm a Canadian and I was lured, you know, kind of lured by that allure to come to the States, right? And, and um, kind of chase that. Um, and, I, and like I said, I didn't, I didn't want it to be a, a bad negative thing, but I think, um, current, current times, at least the last four or five years is like, um, it makes me lean that way a lot and think that way a lot. But I, I do think that I still hold on to, um, that there is a kind of, um, the slow calculated, calculatable demise, but like this really good inkling of hope, just like um, I was saying earlier about, uh, you know, the car that's sitting in the field rotting away, there's still like this hope that somebody uh, is saving it because they want it to bring it back to its future glory. So um, in earlier works, which you can see a lot of the, the tail light pieces, um, those, the, those lights physically lit up. And I think that gave that impression a lot more. So when you lose that, even that like thought of, that small LED light as like a hope, a, a, a beacon of hope. Um, you know, the, these physically lost that, but I, I still think that they're, 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 it's there, right? It's like, it's a hard object. It's, it's probably, it will probably outlast most things. Um, but I, it definitely has a, a feeling of, of, you know, loss or potential loss. And, and I think, um, that ties in into, you know, losing some of that luster of the allure of the American dream, you know, moving here and things like that. Not that it's lost, but like you have to take, you have to take with the good, with the bad. So like, you, you, you know, the, the, the positivity, um, can all be there too, but you know, you kind of have to have those undertones of, of questioning what was or what can be. Right. Do you think, I mean, being, you know, can, you know, growing up in Canada, I don't know how old you were when you moved here, but you know, I'm guessing, you know, after undergrad, given you went to, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I, like I, I grew up. I was like, do you feel like you, that gives you this sort of outsider perspective to sort of see America, you know, one step removed versus someone maybe well, i mean it's interesting because i was i you know, what's called a border baby is like a, 40 years right on the border of buffalo i moved four hours away to go to undergrad which was right on the border of detroit and windsor um so there was like always this duality of like otherness that was that was alluring but only you know i, I mean pre-9-11 crossing the border was was nothing right so there there's the, this otherness with kind of an invisible, you know, border. Um, but there was all, it's always like the grass is greener. Right. Um, and it is in a lot of ways. Uh, but like I said, depending on, you know, what year or, um, you know, what the current times, uh, you do, you do question those things. And I think, um, that happens in a lot of decision-making with the process, with the works that themselves is, you know, um, there's an opportunity there um, to be positive about something or to be to, to negatively um, maybe enhance something. And um, those decisions come out based on, um, you know, all of all of that historical background, some some personal background and, and, and life events and things that led me to that and growing up in my dad's shop and things like that. Um, but also researching, you know, what's what other artists were doing and how you how they deal with those decisions, right? Um, luckily, you know, I even have this silly quote on the wall um, that I've been thinking about recently. Um, I was watching something on Ken Ken Price, who's a ceramicist, most of you probably know, but he said, skill is the gateway to the unconscious um, in 2005. And, you know, working through this, like even physically what I had written is like, skill equals manual labor equals like mindless. So for me, like the technical skill um, becomes um, something that's so inherent that I can be kind of mindless, whether it be sanding or laying bondo or, or laying fiberglass filler or things like that. Um, 
so that you have a freedom of thinking of what the next move is or what the next piece is or like what's coming up tomorrow. So like skill equals manual labor equals mindlessness equals mind space equals like wandering mind, but equals possibilities. So like, I guess all of these things lead up to the kind of situation where like any good hypothesis doesn't come up with, you, you don't come out with an answer. I'm not looking to give answers, but I, I think the, the best thing that the hypothesis does and, and, and uh, chasing that down is like, you end up with a, a thousand more possibilities, right? So um, I think, you know, going through the physical labor of working these things through, um, you know, informs the next one. And, and that, that doesn't mean 100% technically or materially, but like, um, you know, the, the next one can be a little bit more, um, you know, maybe, yeah, a little bit more reflective and a little bit more, um, you know, not as happy maybe, and that's okay. Maybe a little... Um, I think it hopefully speaks to William's question, right? He was, he was interested in that, you know, that kind of thing between, you know, the, the person buying the high end thing, but not really understanding it versus the person who buys a low end thing, but understands the mechanics and understands how it works. I mean, I think that yeah. sort of speaks to the idea of like having a certain sort of physical or tactile skill that opens up maybe possibility for aesthetic or creative decisions. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. But I, you also have to, from experience, you, there, there's burdens with that, right? That you carry along with that. It's like, yeah, I can keep the thing running. Like like my truck, I love it. I would drive it anywhere, do anything with it. But, uh, you know, it's more likely to break down than my wife's pretty new car, you know? So, um, yeah, I have the ability to do it. I, I It's an aesthetic choice. It's a utilitarian choice. Um, and that kind of... Um, those kind of choices, like I was saying, kind of build up this onion of, you know, who you are or who you want to project yourself to be. Um, but at the same point, I yes, I can fix it, but I'm also burdened of like, okay, you know, I'm going to, and this happened a few years ago, like you're going to Thanksgiving dinner and a transmission line blows and you're like, well, uh, I got to fix that and get it home. And, you know, it's not so cool in that small moment, right? <laughs> Um, and then someone's on your website um, looking at some of the earlier works um, mm -hmm. that you know, sort of describes as melting, if you could speak to the... Melting? Yeah. Yeah, like if you see in the background here, if I'm not on, like there's some of those melting barricades up on the wall up here-ish. Um, some of that stuff was like, you know, uh, material exploration and figuring out, you know, what you could do, uh, I, I guess you know, early on in your career, like, if not anything, what are you then a copycat, right? Like working with materials in a way that you're, you're um, enamored with, with other artists or other makers or things like that. So, you know, looking at people like Erwin Worm directly with like things like that, um, um, you know, I, I look, you look to see how you can transform the technical skill set that I have in, you know, that was kind of inherent to growing up in my dad's shop, um, but then using it, um, you know, in a different way. And then, and then honing that to, to have a set of decision-making processes that become what I make, um, and, and differentiate, you know, what my stuff is versus that. Right. So there's like, um, I guess if people are looking at the website, there's some things, um, the taillight pieces are kind of more formed and finished on the bottoms. Um, and they become more of, like I said, a caricature of what that could be. If I say, imagine me ripping the skin off this thing and hanging it on the wall, the bottom would probably look more like the DeSoto piece, right? Like hanging, because um, that's a hood and the back edge of a hood is, you know, is a thinner piece. But um, some of those decisions get lost or made or changed as I go. Um, and you can see that, you know, from the pieces that I'm talking about, like they're up on the wall that were um, you know, kind of melting, uh, uh, sidewalk barricades, um, and then progressing through other things that I think have, um, maybe more intrigue to me. And, and that's where, um, being interested in historical, um, you know, makes and models of cars or implementing, um, small tidbits, like, 
of those pieces uh, become more specific to what I'm making at the time. But there's always like a, a line that runs through all of those weird things, um, you know, going from a, a barricade like that. I have another barricade uh, piece that's in the works um, that kind of harkens back to that, but ties into other things. So like, you know, it's all a blender of, of um, you know, what you did, what, what you're thinking about and what you want to do. Um, you know, and I, it's nice to have the freedom of making those decisions, um, you know, moving forward. Um, I probably know the answer to this, but um, how much of your work is pre-visualized and then how much of it is like, so I, <laughs> oh, whatever happens if, and then you sort of just start into it and let your own kind of curiosity and, you know, the curiosity kind of take the lead. So, so I, I've always battled with that, right? I had a, I had a studio visit uh, in grad school with Diana Al Hadid, and she specifically asked me, um, "Are you an artist or are you a fabricator?" And um, it's always stuck with me. I, at first, I was kind of pissed <laughs> off at that question, and then as I moved through it, I kind of laugh at it. And then um, uh, coming out of grad school, I took the job as the, the sculpture fabricator for Graphic Studio, which is like an artist atelier based in the University of South Florida, which is amazing place, awesome place. But my title was was fabricator and uh, um, and I think that was, that that is specific to like a lot of my drawings because and anyone that spends a pretty good amount on materials, whether it be expensive paper or expensive inks or things like that, you kind of have to work that through so that you can't like you have to say is that somewhat is this worth the time and money to be the next thing right so like. I have my sketchbook here and I like flip back to a long time ago when I had some other things, but like this piece here, like very rudimentary sketch, but like, I don't even know when this was from it. It was within the last year because of the sketchbook, but like it's, it's similar, but very different. Right. Um, the same one here, like this is, this is like this Dodge Ram char um, uh, trail duster hood. Like, I mean, that's, that's what the drawing was a while ago and it stuck in my head and like, Let's see if this will follow. Oh, like this piece is in prog progress process, and it's like, you know, pretty pretty similar. So I would say, um, you know, Diana Al Hadid would probably say, well, you you're closer to fabricator in that situation, right? Um, but in a lot of other ways, it it's a, it's a necessary tool for me to figure out. Um, what needs to be built next, right? At some point you have to be both. Um, would I, would I love to get these things worked out to an area, uh, where I could hand them off and I had enough money to get them finished by a professional finisher? Yes. But I have, I have like a mobile booth in here and like my ventilation stuff. So I do my paintwork because I have to do my paint. The same reason, like we had to, you know, I had to fix my own flat or, uh, you know, if I smacked up my dad's car or my grandpa's truck, I, I had to fix it. Right. It wasn't, wasn't like I had the money to go get someone to do it. So, um, it's out of necessity. Um, but I'm happy to say that I'm both, I do fabrication work for friends. I, I do metal work on the side for, like I said, friends or other unique opportunities, but, um, the monotony of, day-to-day -day fabrication for someone else, um, just as if uh, sitting at an office desk, I couldn't do it physically. So like allowing myself to jump from project to project and you know, figure out how to rewire this thing to make it work the way I want versus like spending hours uh, with the airboard, like sanding that thing out or you know, casting these tires or making mold making. Like I wouldn't say I'm like an expert in anything, but I'm like, pretty good in everything. Um, and, and it's out of necessity. Like I don't have, I don't have the means to ask somebody else to do it. And, and maybe I'll get to that point, you know? I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. So kind of building off of this, it takes you so long to make these objects and it's expensive and, you know, um, you invest so much into it. What is kind of like your failure process? Like what if something totally doesn't work out? At what point do you know that and what do you do? So um, things kick around, right? Like pieces that I, that I get started on, um, 
there's things that maybe won't work for a certain project and, and do work for others. Um, I wouldn't, I mean, I work pretty fast for the amount of work that needs to go into these things. Um, and relatively, uh, yes, they're somewhat more expensive, but it's not like an excuse, right? So um, I, I try and work most things out. And um, I guess you can think of it like, okay, my dad was a body and paint man by, by trade, right? Um, my mom was a hairdresser and a personal trainer and like had the work ethic and willpower like that you know un unmatched right so i i have like a good skill set and and a, and a and a good work ethic so i, I kind of forced these things through but like work like i said working with my dad he ended up selling used cars so we were like you kind of buy at the auction what you think will work and then you put that elbow grease in and, and your knowledge and your, your skill set to make that thing kind of the best thing it could be. Um, and I, I really, I haven't thought about this in a while in that manner, but you're kind of um, working with the hand you're dealt. So, I mean, in some respects, I'm, I'm dealing myself problems into the studio or into the sketchbook that, you know, fall onto the walls of the studio. So the failure process, um, you know, it, it can get scrapped, but I, I really try and make as, you know, make it work as much as possible. Right. So like, I guess on, on the spectrum of the things, it's like, how good can you make this thing? Right. Is it worth like in the car realm? You're like, I know that this could be worth this much and I can work through that and I'm going to get what I can for it. Right. And, um, in, in the sculpture, <laughs> in the sculpture realm, you're like, I hope I can get something for this one day. Right. But, uh, it gives me, and especially setting it up here where I have other people and I have a, a somewhat other, um, you know, income stream where I can really get wild with what I'm making The I'm not really scared about the failure. I am more intrigued as to how that informs the next one. Right. So like the piece is the, the piece becomes the piece and I see almost all of them through you know, is one my, my favorite is, are they all, is it not a good series of things? Yeah. Yeah. There's some things that I love more than others. And, but the failure process, like it definitely happens way more in the sketchbook. There's, there's sketchbooks full of failures, but those get revisited in, in a different time. You know, something one chain, one day can change a lot of things, right? Like everything can be going, you know, pretty good. And, and one day it could be really bad, but, um, you can go back, like I said, I've I flipped back a lot of times and be like, man, that's really close to what I drew for this other project. Why does, why does that make sense to me? Right? Like, why does that, when does that come around? Um, like this, this piece specifically has been sitting on the wall for a long time. And I like bad graffiti painted like this stretch, the stretcher on it. Like, but I drew a picture a long time ago and, I, and I'm this, I'll see this one through, but it's like this, like if you can imagine the skin, like, you know, like a pretty rudimentary wood frame, like you would kind of stretch like a deer hide or something for drying. Um, I thought about stretching these hoods in, in that same manner. So like, um, like if you could think like having like a monster, a monster wood beam and making some sort of truss and, and, and stretcher so that these became, you know, the stretcher for this hood. Right. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what that means or, or why that, you know, why that came to me. It was just like something that I, you know, saw as an image that stuck with me and then kind of um, implemented things that I know and I love um, kind of until they work. Right. So there's things that I look at for a long, long time that I have like bits and pieces to, but it, like we were talking earlier, it's like having like that 3000 piece puzzle where, you know, you're really close, but then you realize you have seven pieces missing and you're like the only thing you want to do and you focus on <laughs> finding those seven pieces and finishing the puzzle, right? Well, I think we're, we're right up on our, our time, right, Angela? I mean, if anyone had one last final burning question for Taylor, but... Um... Well, I guess, um, you know, if... 
I guess that's why it's nice when we're talking about uh, post 2020 being virtual, correct? And um, the, you know, my corner, they're in like quadrants. My quadrant is April, what is it, Mike? April 21st. Prefer. So you're if in you're Northeast. interested, yeah, in the Northeast, if you're interested enough, like those are going to be more um, intimate, small uh, kind of tables of people that can do the same thing. I'll have the same setup. The studio will be open. You'll see what I'm working on then. And like, maybe that's a better format for you to ask any more questions or let, like, let this ruminate and, and ask me questions later. Like I said, I'm open on, on through my website or on Instagram. Um, you can no, get, have, you have to come to the post to ask any questions. You are not allowed to email Taylor between now and the 21st. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, come, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't want to, I don't think it could be sadder, but like, I don't want to be the only person sitting at a virtual table of six and waiting on people. So come on, you know, come on over. It'll, it'll be great. Um, well, thanks, Tara. This was um, a real treat. Um, and thanks for letting us um, inside your studio this year. Yeah. I mean, thanks for bearing with me. I kind of, it was like a, a 360 Blair Witch version of what uh, is going on in my studio, but um, great. It's a, you know, it's an honor to, to be asked to do it. And I love it. This is what, this is where I'm at pretty much every day. Um, and uh, keep swinging away here. <laughs> and just to let everyone know next Thursday, we're having a virtual first Thursday event. So hopefully you all can come same time, same place um, to see a bunch of different galleries. Thank you so much, Michael. It was great. Yeah, See you soon at post. Put that in the chat, would you? Put one of those in the chat for me. <laughs> I owe you one. I owe you one. <laughs> uh, well, thanks, everybody. Good to see some uh, familiar faces and some new ones. Yeah, thanks for everybody coming. That's, uh, I know a bunch of you, but I don't know some of you. So 